Hi, in this lecture we are going to take a look at the chain of events of an immunological response. So in other words, what is happening when a pathogen gets into our body? Like what is the order of events? When does the body decide to pivot to a new avenue or a response? And then after we do that, we'll start actually looking at one of those possible events called humoral immunity. And the previous lecture started to set that up by looking at MHC and antigen presenting macrophages. So I did a whole drawing on a whiteboard that went through antigen presenting macrophages. So we'll start with the chain of events. So when we think about the immune response, we have to think about a pathogen trying to get into our body. And for the sake of ease, I'm just going to think of a bacterial cell. So let's say that you have a bacterial cell that's trying to get into your body. Let's say it's inside of your mouth, for instance, and it's trying to get down into your gum lines, into your blood. Well, the first thing is that you have layers of defense that are kind of about prevention. You know, you've probably heard of the phrase, prevention is the best cure. And so we have kind of something like that where we have, um, you know, our body is anatomically designed to try to keep pathogens from getting in in the first place. And the skin is a perfect example of that. So the skin is very dry, it's inhospitable, and not very many microbes can actually live on the skin. I think the average number is somewhere around six different species of microbes that can tolerate our dry, salty skin conditions. So if you're a microbe that's going here, this is not gonna be good for you. But if you go to the inside of the cheek, which is just as easy to access, it's gonna be much more hospitable because it's wet. So mucous membranes are pretty hospitable, so we actually have lots of microbes in our mouth. One paper actually tried to assess how many microbes we have in our mouth, and they said 700 different species, six to 700. So that just tells you how important being moist is. So mucous membranes are pretty hospitable for a lot of microbes, and from there they try to get deeper into places they should not be. So generally, like dry tries to prevent infection, flushing action, saliva, tears. Actually, you actually have antimicrobial um, enzymes in your tears that cut up part of bacterial cell walls. Otherwise, the eyes would be a great place for bacteria to try to stick on and make a film of bacteria. Urination, another one. So you have a lot of flushing action going on around the mucous membranes to try to clear out bacteria. But let's say a bacterium gets into our deeper tissues, it gets past the surface defenses, then what? The next response is the innate immune response. So we're gonna assume that we get an invasion of bacteria into our tissues. And so now, Mast cells, if it's in the tissues, or basophils, if it's in the blood, are going to be alerted to their presence and degranulate. And this is going to start the inflammatory process. And this is part of our innate immune response. Remember, the innate immune response is going to be the nonspecific but rapid immune response that we basically have towards all potential pathogens. So a pathogen comes in, it doesn't matter if it's bacteria of species A, bacteria of species B, a worm, a virus, COVID, it doesn't matter. You're gonna have the same kind of response. It's just try to eat the problem before it gets too big. So the goal of inflammation is to try to contain the problem and solve the problem right then and there. So nine times out of 10, it's successful. We know the end game of inflammation is to bring out our phagocytes. We are literally trying to eat our problem. Okay, so at this point, we have to think about what does success look like? When do we win 
When does the bacterium win? So it has to do with how quickly the pathogen can replicate versus our ability to kill them, which usually, except for worms, involves eating them or phagocytosis. So imagine for a moment that a bacterium gets into our tissues. That bacterium can replicate maybe like every 20 minutes. It's actually a typical replication time. So after 20 minutes, it's two bacteria. After 40 minutes, it's four bacteria. Then it becomes eight bacteria, right? So it's, it's an exponential growth curve. Meanwhile, you're trying to call out your phagocytes. The neutrophils are kind of the biggest players here because they're the most numerous in the blood. So there's my neutrophil. And they're gonna try and eat up that pathogen. So who's winning, the neutrophils or the bacteria? Well, it's, it's basically a race. The phagocytes have to be able to eat up the pathogens faster than they can replicate. If they do, then you're winning. You're, think of this as like Pac-Man, you're eating them up faster than they can replicate, you're going to win. But if they replicate faster than you eat them, they're winning. So they're able to multiply faster than you can clean them up. Think of like stray cats, for instance, or feral cats giving birth to a bunch of, of kittens. And then you work for an organization that tries to capture kittens and um, spay them or neuter them so that you don't have a continual feral problem. But if they replicate faster than you can capture and spay them or neuter them, you're going to have a population explosion of cats. But if you can capture the kittens and spay them and neuter them faster than they can replicate, then that population will go down. So this is actually the basic premise of whether or not you're winning. You as a person are winning against a pathogen. Can you eat them faster than they can replicate? And that is the question. So if the pathogen gets in and you're able to eat them up faster than they can replicate and you eat them all up in their little tissue, that's it, game over. Pathogen is eradicated and you're fine. And that is pretty much the end of the story. Right now, somewhere in your body, inflammation is happening. The inflammatory response is trying to deal with a bacterium that got into your gum lines, bacteria that are getting into your gut, a small cut in your mouth, a small cut on your skin, bacteria are getting in and you're eating them up and like, we win, we win, we win. Sometimes you don't. And there can be a variety of reasons for this. I don't wanna to get too much into the nitty gritty here because this is not a microbiology class, but I know on everybody's mind, we're always thinking about COVID and what we can do to reduce our risk. So imagine if you get exposed to somebody who is COVID positive, and let's say that you have no immunity, you're not vaccinated, you're not, um, you don't have prior exposure, and you inhale some viruses into your nose. Are you going to get COVID? Well. It depends. Can they replicate and infect your cells faster than you can eat them? <laughs> well, what, what determines that? Well, one of which is the actual number of viruses that land in your nasal cavity. If only two viruses land in your nasal cavity, you're probably going to be able to eat them up and then that's over. You don't get sick. Which is why a minimal exposure probably won't get you sick. But if you're intubating a patient that has serious COVID and when you intubate them, it causes a big aerosolization of viruses and now comes 5 billion viruses out of their uh, respiratory tract and then you're not masked and you inhale it, well, 5 billion, two, totally different scenario. They're gonna have a lot more difficulty trying to clean up 5 billion before they start replicating. So in this way, when we think about whether or not inflammation is gonna solve your problem, a lot of it has to do with how much got in in the first place. Some of it has to do with the actual pathogen. And again, that's really much more for a microbiology class, but a lot of the infectious disease topics are about how specific pathogens are really good at evading inflammation. So for our purposes, coming back here, our end game is that phagocytes emerge and try to eat the, the pathogens. And there's kind of two outcomes here. Success, we ate them all. Awesome. So if our uh, phagocytes are able to eat all of the pathogens, then you win. And when that happens, it's over. There's no further 
steps necessary in the immune system, the immune response um, basically tapers off and you're, it's done. The other possibility is that you are not successful. You don't win. In this case, the pathogen is able to replicate faster than you can phagocytose them. If that is the case, you cannot rely on inflammation alone. You have to pull out other players into the system and activate other immune processes. And this is what is known as acquired immunity. And I'm gonna throw in here complement. So complement is not directly associated with inflammation, but it is an innate response. And as part of that innate response, complement basically activates a series of plasma proteins that are running around your blood. And as part of that, the MAC or membrane attack complex is activated and the individual cylinders insert themselves into foreign membrane pop open like a rosette, create a pore, and it's a pretty big pore, so much bigger than a channel protein, and then water and ions are quickly able to move, the entire membrane becomes unstable, and then usually lyses. So this is another way to kill foreign cells, and not only will it kill um, certain types of bacteria and viruses, it will also kill transplanted cells. So when we talk about a transplant rejection or a transfusion rejection from blood, so you get a blood type that is different, that's complement. Complement is actually causing that rapid lysis of the foreign red blood cells that your body goes, that is not you. So if we are not successful, then we are going to activate acquired immunity. Now, acquired immunity has two branches to itself. The phrase acquired means that it's something you develop through exposure. Innate is you're born with it. Acquired is you develop it over time. So the acquired immune response has two sub-branches. One is called humoral immunity and one is called cell-mediated immunity. Humoral immunity's end game is to bring out the antibodies. And in a previous lecture, I went through why antibodies are magical. They're amazing. They do all kinds of great things for you. But one of the major things that they do is they make phagocytosis a lot easier. So you absolutely need to know all of the different ways that antibodies help us fight pathogens. So one of the ways that antibodies are so effective is remember that antibodies are gonna to bind to the antigen. And very often the antigen is actually a surface molecule on the bacterium or the virus. So when these antibodies bind, they stick out these stems of the antibodies and those stems act like grippers. So it's much easier to grab onto the grippers or the stems of the antibodies. So the phagocytes very often are not very successful and kind of wrapping their cytoplasmic extensions around a particular pathogen because they're like too slippery. They don't get a good grip on them. So instead, you have these antibodies that basically give purchase. You have now something to grip onto, it's really easy. So instead of spending a whole bunch of time trying to like hold a slippery fish, it's like, oh, got it. And you phagocytose it. So it's much easier then to go, oh, eat, oh, eat, won't eat, then be like, I'm trying to get my fingers on it, I just can't quite get around this pathogen and bring it in. Because if you spend too much time trying to work on one pathogen, then 
other pathogens are replicating faster than you can eat them. But if you can eat them really quick, then you're going to eat them faster than they can replicate. And remember, that's the balance where we start to win. So antibodies are instrumental in enhancing phagocytosis. They make it a lot easier. The other thing antibodies do is they actually aggregate themselves together in what is called agglutination. And this is investigated in lab 16, so you'll have a better example of how agglutination works because we actually use that phenomenon to determine blood type. And then the third way that antibodies are really useful is that they prevent that pathogen from actually attaching. So if I was a pathogen and I was surrounded by antibodies, it would be very similar to me having a bunch of like, um, you guys know those like little toy bow and arrows that have like a rubber um, suction cup on one end and you, you know, they're, they're kind of cheap. You get them at like grocery stores. And so imagine if like somebody was to cover me with those arrows with the basically little suction cups and all these arrows are sticking out everywhere. In order for me to infect, most bacteria, for most bacteria, this is true, and for all viruses, this is true. In order for me to infect, I actually have to grab onto a receptor on one of my cells. So I'm the pathogen. I have to like grab onto a receptor that that cell is expressing. So I'm a pretend ligand. But if I'm covered in arrows, then there, those stems are getting in the way and it prevents attachment. It also prevents attachment for toxins. So if you have something like rattlesnake toxins, right? So you get bit by a rattlesnake and then that toxin is gonna circulate around your blood, you might get anti-venom and anti-venom is going to be antibodies to that toxin. So it binds to the toxin and prevents that toxin from binding to our cells and prevents it from activating physiological responses that should not be activated. So that is how we basically neutralize toxins is with antibodies. So it also prevents attachment, and this usually will at least in, at least retard, but it may completely stop that pathogen's ability to infect our cells. So super important, once you bring out your antibodies, you are in really good shape usually. Humoral immunity is activated for all pathogens. Once you get to the stage where you are not successful with inflammation, and you decide, yes, we are going to act activate acquired immunity, humoral immunity is always going to be activated. It does not matter if you are a bacteria, if you are a virus, if you are an extracellular pathogen, or you are an intracellular pathogen. Antibodies will always be useful. Cell-mediated immunity is a branch that is sometimes also activated. So your choices are you activate humoral immunity all by yourself, and that's it, or you activate humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. There's never a situation where you only activate cell-mediated immunity. So it's always just humoral immunity or humoral and cell-mediated immunity. So what is the end game of cell-mediated immunity? Well, in order to understand the end game of cell-mediated immunity, we have to understand that antibodies are not always the full solution. So in this case, we have antibodies that are going to be coding antigens, but antibodies stay in the extracellular fluid. So briefly, let's say that I have some cells here and I have a virus. This is kind of my typical virus. There's my virus. As long as my virus is outside in the extracellular fluid, so this is ECF, this would be ICF, then antibodies can in fact bind them like so and prevent attachment. But if that virus is capable of getting into my cell and it's now infecting my cell, and it's gonna use my cell as a haven to replicate in, then the antibodies do not follow it in. So the antibodies are left wondering where the pathogen went. They can't find them. So antibodies are not 
fully effective if you have an intracellular pathogen? Well, which pathogens are intracellular? All viral infections are intracellular. The viruses spend some of their time outside of the cell and some of their time inside of the cell. When the virus is outside of the cell, antibodies are effective. But when they are inside of the cell, the antibodies are not effective at all. So we need another way to basically find and deal with pathogens that are inside of our cells. And not all pathogens go inside of our cells. A lot of bacteria and most parasites stay outside of our cells, in which case humoral immunity is your full solution. But for all viruses and some bacteria, they go inside of our cells. So what can we do then? Well, at this point, we are going to need a way to identify and kill our own cells. You heard that right. You are going to destroy your own cell. And in doing so, you are going to destroy the pathogen within. And this is called cell-mediated immunity. So in this case, the end game is going to be to identify and destroy our own infected cells. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the process of immunity. So in other words, here we're looking at what is the chronological order of events? So we start with trying to prevent the bacteria from getting in at all. But if they do get in or the virus, whatever it is, gets in, then inflammation is activated. Lots of times inflammation is successful. You can clean up the pathogens faster than they replicate, at which point it's over, you're done. But when you're not successful, then you have an infection. So this is, this is the start of an infection. in which case you have to activate acquired immunity. And acquired immunity is going to rely heavily on the lymphocytes. And here, acquired immunity is broken down into two branches. We have humoral immunity and we have cell-mediated immunity. And humoral immunity's goal is to generate antibodies. Cell-mediated immunity's goal is going to be to find and destroy infected cells. This is so important, I'm gonna say it again. If you get to the point where you have an infection and you activate um, acquired immunity, you will always activate humoral immunity. You may also activate cell-mediated immunity, but only if the pathogen is inside of your cells as well. Okay, so at this point, I'm actually gonna stop this. I was gonna go through both chain of events and humoral immunity, I spent so long on chain of events, I think I'm gonna make this its own video. And then I'm gonna come back and do humoral immunity separately.